Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, my name's Doug. And uh, Cine and Claire, where are you? Raise your hands. Um, how are we going to work this? Are you going to come on stage? Are you going to stay side stage? And then I know you're, I'm going to start, but do you want to be sitting awkwardly on stage or standing awkwardly <laughs> side stage? OK. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about making music with machines and uh, specifically a project called Magenta that um, I've been working on. I started uh, about three and a half years ago and I've been working on uh, ever since then. Um, and about a little bit, maybe uh, two thirds of the way through this uh, presentation, uh, we're gonna invite uh, Cine and Claire on stage and they're gonna talk about a, a case study. In fact, I think it's, it's completely perfect that I was delayed in my travel from Paris because it makes absolute sense that Chris went first. And in fact, I think we can think about the, the next talk not as one case study, but several case studies in trying to understand how to connect users to music via AI and how to handle some of the design issues. Um, Nita's here too. So we have actually more, we have multiple case studies going on and we intend to do more. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I have a clicker. Haha. -ha. Good. And I had time to steal that. So. <laughs> I had to, I had to uh, take care of a, a video problem, so I, I thought I would um, contextualize our work um, with respect to Chris's Venn diagram. Um, I'm very firmly on the uh, beaver side, on the uh, machine learning side. I would say safely that Cine and Claire are definitely much more on the uh, duck side. And our goal with Magenta is to be a platypus. I like this. I may use this again, by the way. I, don't know, so I guess I should credit Chris with that. I know it's not his, uh, his, his Venn diagram, but still. OK. So um, I'm going to talk about a project, this project called Magenta. There are many, to, uh, many people to thank, um, far too many to name here. This project has been going on for, you know, again, over three years. And um, everything that we do is on our blog at g.co slash magenta. So, um, you know, to credit people is to send you to the blog. That's one of my main calls to action is to check out the work that we're doing. And um, I'm going to use this slide just to mention a couple of things that are, that are not, actually, I can go to our next slide and talk about our mission. So our mission is, uh, or the definition of our project is an open source research project exploring the role of machine learning as a tool in the creative process. And, and we've been wrestling with a number of issues that came from Chris's talk. So we certainly have issues with user trust and helping users understand what's happening with machine learning in the, in the context of the arts and music. Um, we also wrestle quite a bit with this distinction between agent and assistant. And I think it's, it's a brilliant distinction. I will, in order, buy, read, and review, and then report case studies on Chris's book. Can't promise how long it'll take me to get through the book, though. I'm, I'm a, I've got a backlog. Um, and I, I want to invite you to kind of get into the space that we're working in to think about now switch to music uh, and think about an electric guitar. Okay, How many people here play an instrument? That's not surprising, especially in a group. Uh, surprised actually to not see more hands. I'm suspecting that some of you are thinking, what does he mean by play? I took two years of piano lessons. How many people have ever played a musical instrument? Yeah, it's, that's really what it's about. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so think of an electric guitar, and, and the analogy of the electric guitar is here to think about the, the power of technology in the arts and the utter necessity of having technology to make art and make music. So when you plug, if, you, if you've played an electric guitar, you plug it into this big amplifier, you turn it on, you turn up the amp, maybe you have some pedals that add a little bit of distortion or echo, and you play an E chord, boom, and you feel like a guitar god, right? Now you unplug the chord, drop it on the floor, and you play that same E chord, and it, it barely makes any noise at all. And you realize that you're getting a lot of help from that guitar, right? A lot is happening with technology here. And I would argue pretty firmly that that's in the, in the, in the arena of an assistant. It's an extension of you. In fact, it does feel like you're making that sound, which is a nice, a nice kind of cognitive extension. Now let's talk about the drum machine. Um, the drum machine, I think, has far less uh, of this assistant quality to it, right? I mean, if you, if you program the drum machine, if you're actually thinking about the beats that you're making, I think it becomes an, a, a, an extension of yourself. But largely, it's, it's, I think, an agent on its own solving some problem for you, right? Now, what I would argue is that if we move towards the field of machine learning that I work in and that Magenta works in, which is called generative models, 
So it's neither clustering nor classification, but it is trying to build models that can understand some data set and generate new instances from that data set. There's a bunch of paradoxes there because you're not supposed to repeat the exact things you trained on, so you're never gonna get them all right, right? Anyway, let's, let's not talk about that for the moment. But what I'm thinking about more is I would add uh, somewhere in between assistance and agency is this idea of partnership. That if you have an agent that's actually generative and in some ways perceptual, so it's listening and responding, then this, a this, this piece of code can have its own sort of agency. It can be playing music on its own. It might be very, very good at playing drums. But if it's listening to you and you're playing along with it, then even though you're not directly controlling it, maybe you're playing guitar and it's playing drums. You have this nice mixture of agency and assistance that I think is, is perhaps music is the best place to explore this because we can play with generative models. We're not likely going to offend anyone. We might bore them, but unless we're, <laughs> unless we're doing lyrics, we're, we're, we're sort of safe from, from all of the toxicity that lives in language, but we can still train powerful models and understand these feedback loops, et cetera. So um, I spent a lot of time on that slide, but I, I think it's worthwhile. I think these workshops should be more discussions than, than perhaps you know, talks. So I invite future speakers to, to continue this conversation. And quickly, you can find the platypus online. Just kind of paste it into your slides and, and ask them to reload. So um, I'm going to stick with our mission and quickly go through some of, some of the work that we've done. Um, first, I want to focus on open source. This is largely informational, but I want you to understand what we've been trying to achieve. And first, we're a rather popular, I'm proud to say, open source project. We're part of the TensorFlow uh, programming language, machine learning programming language uh, project. And we have you know, 14,000 stars and 2.900 forks, and, or 2.9 thousand forks. And if, you've, if you're like a nerd that tracks things like GitHub, those are good numbers to have. Um, we've also really um, gotten an immense lift out of working with JavaScript in place of Python. Python's the programming language that's almost always used right now for machine learning, for training large models. But the design community and the creative coding community is living in, in uh, JavaScript. So we are very grateful for the work that came out of the pair group in Cambridge, um, a very nice JavaScript toolkit called TensorFlow.js. It started off as DeepLearn.js, and then we very quickly launched Magenta.js as just a layer of really helpful code to be able to play around in the space of music. So what you see here, for those of you that aren't coders, check your mail, it's fine. Um, th the code on the left is playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Those are just the defined notes. The code on the right is going to morph a melody between Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and I'm a Little Teapot um, using a trained machine learning model. So you can actually pull in trained models and work with them uh, fairly easily. It does require code, but that code is relatively straightforward to use. So um, open source is covered. I think we're going to be critical a little bit later of the work we've done and look at directions to grow. But I'm really happy with our open source work. I'm also relatively happy overall with the output of our research. So um, we're part of a team called Google Brain. Um, it's the same. In fact, it's the same team that the, that Pear contributes to and is, is largely part of. Um, there's crossovers with other groups. And um, so part of our mission is to move the field of machine learning. And we've been working in the space of generative models for media, including drawing, uh, images, uh, some text, and a lot of work with music. And so I'm very happy with that output. We have um, um, every year we're running a big creativity workshop at a, a conference called NeurIPS, which is one of the, the main machine learning conferences. And that's sort of where we live. That's why we're on the um, beaver side not the duck side. We, we sort of live and breathe machine learning, and um, I think we're doing well there. Um, let's, li let's listen to... Okay, don't play the next one yet. That was our sort of our test signal when we started Magenta. We actually launched an empty GitHub and, and a blog that said, here we are. And then we um, basically trained what's called a recurrent neural network to generate melodies from what are called MIDI files, basically just musical scores. Um, it's fundamentally work I did like in 2002. And, and that's, that's where we were. That's sort of where we started. There was better work out there than that, certainly. But there was not a lot of work being done in music generation. Um, below what you'll hear now is where we are at 2019. Don't play yet. This is um, a model called a transformer, which is a replacement for a recurrent neural network, and it's trained on a lot of performance data. So that is, 
we took uh, audio of piano performances and we used machine learning to find the notes. And not just the, the pitch value, like it's a middle C, but the timing, like how many milliseconds into the song is that, P, is that note occurring and how loud is it? So we can capture the kind of, the kind of choices that musicians are making when they're, when they're, ex, uh, when they're uh, playing an expressive performance. And this is a generation of a performance entirely made up by the neural network. Um, to give you an example, let's play that clip now. Oh, I just click, boom. It ended. Okay, um, I've spent, what I'm gonna do now is um, skip some slides and I'm happy to talk. So we're gonna go through some slides where the video is gonna start and I'm gonna try to skip them. That's because I wanna make sure we have enough time for uh, Claire and Cindy to come on. And I spent, I think, very useful time up front talking about some of the ideas responding to Chris. So we're not gonna get to see a couple of videos. They're all on the blog. Um, and these are about the creative process. Um, this is how bad our launch was in terms of usability. That's the command you're supposed to type into your computer to generate music, how much better things got when we worked on hardware and we worked on a project called Magenta Studio, which is software that is more, much more useful for musicians than is uh, a command line and a Python prompt. And now we're going to welcome on stage uh, Claire and Cine to talk about their experience in helping us design exactly uh, these tools. Thank you, Doc. Hi, I'm Sina Nerli, Design Lead at uh, Google Research. And I'm Claire Kajajic. Uh, okay, we're skipping. Okay, there we go. That's the slide I was hoping to see. Uh, my name is Claire Kajajic. I'm a senior user experience researcher. And our story is about how, over the course of three months, uh, UXers like Sine and me and Magenta, a group of machine learning research scientists, collaborated in order to make a new music composition tool called Magenta Studio, which is what Doug just showed you. Very briefly, I'm gonna start from the beginning. So Pear launched a rotation program in which three UXers were embedded into a host team of research scientists, and that team was Magenta. Uh, so we worked with Magenta to build this brand new machine learning backed music composition tool. And we brought to the table our UX knowledge and processes, and in return, we learned about machine learning. And along the way, we learned a lot about best practices when designing for AI systems and collaborating with research scientists. Um, so we're excited to share a few of those learnings with you today, but before I jump into that, I just wanna touch on the goals that we were hoping to do over the course of our rotation. So we really wanted to build tools to meet the needs of musicians, first and foremost and help them in their creative process. We also wanted to showcase Magenta's amazing work with creative generative models in a way that all musicians could really access without the knowledge of command line or having to access the GitHub repositories that, that Doug showed you earlier. Finally, we also wanted to include UX in the development of ML products, and as we're talking about today, really advance the awareness of the benefits of participatory ML systems. So I mentioned before that we figured out some best practices along the way for how to design for AI and work with machine learning research scientists. And the first thing that really helped us was to take the time to explain processes and timelines. So for example, how long does it take to synthesize UX research findings or create a new design language for a brand new UI? or train a machine learning research model, and cross-functional team members may not know or understand how long these things take. So being upfront about these key events can really help to make any timelines that you do create much more actionable and realistic. Um, another thing that really helped us was to institute a show and tell of just daily work examples. So this really helped us to get a feel for individual people's skill sets and set appropriate expectations for final deliverables. 
The second thing that really aided in our collaboration was to do a design sprint together. And we did this right in the beginning of our rotation, which really helped us to set the stage. And we sprinted to understand the opportunity space and to generate some product ideas. And creating something new together really helped to bond the team together and create that shared vision for the future. The output of the design sprint, um, yes, with some googly eyes and pipe cleaners, <laughs> Uh, became not in that rendition, but in a different form, the first ideas that we shared with musicians uh, in our user research studies. Taking some time to do some user research is really so important because it can help you to identify problems that you didn't even really realize were there by understanding how people outside of your group think about things. And it can even help you to make decisions and change direction. Which leads me to our third point, which is to invest in user research. Um, so one really fun moment for us during the course of our rotation was when we brought Magenta into a participatory design session. Participatory design, as Chris actually talked about earlier. Um, and this image is from the California Institute for the Arts in Los Angeles, also called CalArts. Um, and there were 24 different uh, students and faculty from the music technology program that were there that were identified as our key audience or our target audience. So Magenta came with us down to LA, including Doug Eck, who you see right there. Um, and they interacted directly with these target audience members to better understand what they need and what they want from a machine learning backed music composition tool. Um, from this research, we realized really just how important it was not to overly automate the system. So although the models were capable of producing finalized material, it was important for us not to actually use that directly because it really took the joy out of the artistic creation for the musicians and it lessened their feeling of ownership over the final product. So uh, we actually eliminated some of our concepts very early on just because they felt like they didn't allow for enough user agency. Another insight that came from research was that it was ideal to shape the models in a way that would work with existing workflows that musicians had so that they wouldn't have to learn how to incorporate a new tool or switch back and forth between tools, and they would be more likely then to incorporate any new tool that we, we did make for them. Thanks. So I'll take us to um, our tip number four, which is building on people's existing mental models. So a mental model is the way that people think about, um, so it's the internal explanation about how something works. And that uh, explanation, they grasp that and it enforces how they interact with a product or a feature. So if you build your designs on existing mental models, you can help the user feel more uh, comfortable and build more effective mental models for the AI solution that you're creating. So a um, method we used is called TripTech, which is developed at Google. And we basically use that to validate people's needs and the mental models in early pro product development stages. And the insights that we then get from that, we then use to, um, to influence the, our product decisions. So I won't go too deep into this method. But basically, you, you, have, you take a set of problem statements. And we got our statements from the research that we had already done. And one of the statements is the one you see up here, which is, I have a musical idea that I like, but I don't know what should come next. And then you take these statements, and you validate them with users in terms of figuring out how frequent do these problems happen, and how important is it to address uh, and solve that problem. So we also wanted to get qualitative uh, data out of uh, the users. So we presented them with these sort of three panel storyboards that you see here, where you basically first show them a, uh, the problem statement, then a solution, and then the impact that that solution has on the problem. And with this specific storyboard here, we gathered and we got insight around how musicians tend to sort of noodle around with their musical ideas and how important it is to have agency when they're creating their music. So we were able to take that insight and take that back when we were creating our uh, product design, but actually also when we were creating the model design. So we talked to researchers and we discussed which parameters would, be, would the users be able to tweak in this model and 
even down to the to the basics of how many bars of music should the model be able to output for the users. So this is our fifth and final tip, which is it's so important to intru introduce your designs early in the process to the entire cross-functional team. In our process, we had a miscommunication around one of the capabilities of one of the models that we were using. But luckily, we had design critiques very early on in the process, so we caught it early and were able to correct for it. But this is actually one of the most common issues we see when teams turn ML model outputs into products. So we do really encourage you to share out early. It can be quick sketches like this, even before that, when you just do whiteboard sketches or doodlings or something like that. Share out, get the entire cross-functional team in there, discuss what current models do, what future planned models do, what training data, it's, it, what data will be trained on, what's the capabilities, what the, what's the output. Um, a good rule of thumb, actually, is to make sure that all non-research scientist uh, participants in the team are able to describe what a model does in their very own words. words. Then you can hopefully avoid some of these misunderstandings. So let's get to the ending of this story. So we transformed rough sketches into designs with user research, and then we built a prototype for Magenta Studio. And while we didn't have time in the three months um, we had to incorporate this into musicians already working uh, workflows, um, Magenta luckily uh, marched on and eventually we launched these five musical plugins into Ableton Live, which is a digital audio workstation that many, many musicians use to create their music. So now musicians are able to create beautiful machine learning music with um, Magenta's generative models without knowing ML, without knowing code, without knowing Python or, Git, uh, or GitHub or anything like that. So let's quickly look at the goals again. So we ended up building tools for musicians that met their user needs and that they actually enjoy in using in their creative process. We also um, showcased Magenta's work to a broader audience of non-researchers and non-engineering. And we also had a really great collaboration with Magenta where um, we had a mutual, mutual learning experience and where we advanced sort of the awareness around the benefits of participatory ML, both in terms of inviting more people and more functions and roles into the team, but also involving users in both developing the, the product design but also the model design. And lastly, we also learned a lot in the process in which some of that content has actually informed some of the bits of the guidebook that we've heard about today and that we'll speak more about later on. So, Doc, if you're ready to close it up, I'll invite you back up to the stage. Or are we out of time? I think, how much, how are we doing on time? Anybody? We're okay? <laughs> Let's go with it. I'm just going to run with it. Well, I'm going to backtrack. Wait, where are we? That's Chris. How did Chris get there? Chris already spoke. <laughs> um, I want to pull up. I had a. I, I, I apologize for these slides not being in perfect order. I usually work from my laptop. By the way, I'm wearing this shirt today. <laughs> um, I guess I don't have many clothes. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to put this slide up for discussion and close things out. This was an amazing experience, and it's changed how we do our research. Um, we continue to collaborate with, uh, with designers, with UX people, front-end people, HCI people, um, user experience researchers. And I would predict that um, machine learning, from my viewpoint, will continue to move in that direction and that these fields will, in some ways, merge. That doesn't mean that there won't be practitioners that only do one or only do the other. But the big challenges we're facing, I think, are bringing machine learning and AI into people's lives. And as soon as you do that, then you'd better care about people's lives. And so I think, as I think of training new graduate students, um, I would strongly suggest to machine learning grad students that they, that they take some, do some design work, understand the field of HCI and UX, and vice versa. Uh, those of you that don't do machine learning, try, as, try to go as far as you can. Um, you know, the field is a little bit less technical than you might think. It feels more technical than it really is. I mean, neural networks are big, but they're fundamentally understandable, I think. Um, where are we going with Magenta? This should all um, make sense to the folks in this room. We really care more and more about user-in-the-loop learning. 
So can these users of our tools actually train them on their own? Could they train them while not on the internet? Could they take the weights that they, the machine learned, use them to make their own music, and throw the weights away? That's fine with us. Um, can we personalize for people in a really radical way? I think music and art is about personalization. It's about someone making his or her own statement. Can we help them make that? Um, and moving away from code, can we build hardware that does the right thing? Um, can we also build maybe apps for phones that do the right thing, that don't feel like an add-on tool to something else? Um, we're also really interested in Google's new platform for gaming called Stadia, which is um, already public and launching in a couple of weeks. Um, can we use gaming as a platform for better understanding how users want to interact in this space? Um, two calls to action from me. One of them, no, they're both selfish, but that's okay. I think we started that way. Let's all do selfish calls to action. Um, um, we will grow in Europe, Paris and London, and um, I'm saying this because I'm here in London right now. There's always growth in, in, at Google in Mountain View as well, uh, everywhere, at Cambridge as well. I'm gonna like, not name a site that someone is in the room from. And um, focus even more on human-centered design. I didn't put this in the slide from a, from a very machine learning perspective in my group. So starting with machine learning, I'm trying to move more and more towards, towards these ideas. Um, people are interested, please contact me. And please do check out our blog. Um, it's become quite a nice resource. We have tons of uh, examples from people from outside of our group doing demos. Um, a great album came out that was uh, AI driven by a band called Yacht in LA that I suggest listening to. And um, yeah, I guess we've been going on for a while. Um, I'll pass the mic.